On behalf of Ministry of Education, sir, I am Kush Prakash Sharma, Innovation Officer. I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Malthi Lakshmi Kumaran, and the faculty member and student from IS Institutes, who joined online for the second session of IP Talk Series. IP Talk Series is organized for the IC institution in collaboration with the Indian Patent Office to celebrate the award. <laughs> As you will be aware, that the word intellectual property is observed every year on April 26th, and the day is celebrated to raise awareness on IPR. Today's session is on best practices for documentation of research and conducting preliminary assessment of patentability. And uh, expert speaker is Dr. Malthi Lakshmi Kumaran. It's my privilege to introduce the speaker of the today's session. Dr. Malthi Kumar, uh, Lakshmi Kumaran completed her PhD in 1980 from the Pune University and did her post doctoral research at VP Test Institute in New Delhi. She served as the head of the biotechnology division in the Tari University. She also served as a task force member on the several DBT and DST committees. She has more than 30 years of experience in the field of biochemistry and molecular biology. She has more than 100 publications to her credit in various international and Indian journals. She played an important role in uh, starting the Women in Science scheme called Kiran IPR under the TIFAC. She also undertakes extensive work for the startup and incubating and advising them on the patents. She has worked with the WIPO as the content writer. At present, she served as the executive director and heads the IP division of the firm Lakshmi Kumar and uh, Sridhar Tonis. She is a registered patent agent and has been actively engaged in preparing, filing, and prosecuting of patent application both in India and abroad on pharmaceutical and biotechnological patent application. She has been awarded with numerous recognition and awards, adding to her strong portfolio, of which of, uh, are some of them are recipient of National Young Women Scientist Award by Department of Biotechnology in the March 2000. Top 100 women powerful in uh, women in law uh, 2020 by World IP Forum. Thank you for joining us with ma'am. I request all the viewers to post your question in the comment section in YouTube and we will take at least four to five questions at the end of the session. Now the session is over to you, Malti ma'am. Please. Yes. Yes. Now. Can I share the screen? Yes, yes, please. You have to give me the this thing. Uh... You have the rights. Share okay. your can you see? Yes, yes. It's loaded. Yes, yes. You can see now? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Put this presentation on the like uh, presentation view. Model. Yeah, I will. Can you see it? Yes, Perfectly yes. Fine. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so thank you, um, uh, Ankush Sharma, for this for this uh, nice introduction. And I'd also like to thank uh, IPO and uh, RCG, Dr. Unnat Pandit and Dr. Dinesh Patel for giving us an opportunity to present in front of uh, students and staff members as such. Today, my topic, I, I heard yesterday Dr. Unnat Pandit and it was an excellent talk. So it's just a continuation of what we did yesterday. And today the topic given to me is documentation of research. I'm not given the whole title and patentability assessment. Now, before I go to that, I'll just try to explain what do we mean by research? What do we mean by inventions? What are innovations? Can an idea be patented? Should it actually be practiced? Should it be enabled? These are some of the questions I've been. For me, I've been a scientist. I've been a professor for 25 years. I had a lot of students do their PhD with me. And I'll tell you, at that time, I never went and saw even a patent document. We always thought when we are doing research that we should publish. And I remember Dr. Mashalkar's uh, statement saying, publish and perish. So you publish, you will perish. But if you don't publish, you patent it and then publish, then you can get the publication, you can get your patent and this. But many times we don't know. We can write a very good publication. We can do great research. But how do you convert your ideas? How do you convert your research into a publication? How do you convert your research into a patent document, a specification? What are the claims? These are quite mind boggling for students and researchers. And so let's go and see how we are going to do it. And this it's a, a very short introduction I'll give. There are many different forms of IPRs, patent, designs, trademark, copyright, plant variety protection, trade secrets, and so on. So we don't have any law for trade secret, but today I'll be only keeping it with patents because these are researchers 
and we are going to see how we can protect our innovation through IP and that is mainly through patent. What I always talk of is the IPR life cycle and I think I must have shown this slide n number of times. That is you create a research and development that is a creation stage and that is what we're going to spend a lot of time today. What are the things that we need to do? How do you document your research? How do you make your log books and so on? So research and development is the first key important thing before you can actually get your innovation and protect it. The next comes IP protection, which is what we will be talking about, and then comes commercialization. And when you commercialize, not all patents get commercialized, but they most do get. Whenever you think you can do and plan it in the beginning itself, am I going to commercialize my product? When you commercialize, you get your revenue and you pour it back into the creation. And therefore, creation, protection, marketization, are the three forms of the IPR life cycle. People always tell me, you know, should it be a great Nobel Prize winning idea? Can I? But no, even a small innovation can be patented. And I'll explain to this in the next, like the post-it pad, people didn't know that they could even uh, go and a gum or an adhesive, which is a post-it pad, can you come and actually make an innovation? I don't want to spend too much time on this because Dr. Pandit did deal a lot yesterday, but then it is not necessarily that you have a product and you have only one IP. You can have a product like a phone. It is a patent for how it works. What is your innovation? What is the research in it? Is it a chip? Is it a, a, a software to run something and so on? Those are the innovations there and you get a patent protection for that. But they can also be copyright. It can be for the code. It can be for the way it is there. And that is where you get a copyright protection where it's an expression of an idea. The design, how is it designed? How does it look? It's an aesthetic appeal, how it looks. It does not have any function to that uh, design, but the look and the feel of it is what you get as a design protection. And finally, we know trademark. That is the logo, the name, and so on. And even small kids can identify a Coca-Cola bottle or an iPhone or an iPad or a Samsung. Or you tell them a car going on. They don't know much, but they'll say, this is a Maruti Suzuki, this is a Ford. And I'm always amazed at how they can make this out. A lot of the thing is the logo. So whenever you think of innovations, yes, you think of patterns, you think of the research but also think of copyright, designs, trademark, because all put together, you'll get a much higher value than for just one of those IP protection. But today, since we're talking about research and development, we're mainly going to talk about patents. The term of the patent is 20 years from the date of the filing or 20 years from the international date of the filing. Don't worry about other things. So remember, you get a monopoly for 20 years, but in IP, it can be a negative right. It is a, some of it is a positive right. A trademark is a positive right. A patent can be a negative right. And I'll explain to that as I go along. Now, before we as researchers understand what is it that we are protecting, we are protecting an invention. We are protecting an innovation. And to understand what those inventions are, it has to be new product or a process. It has to involve an inventor step and it has to be capable of industrial application. So these are the three criteria, novelty, inventor step and utility that we call. Every time you think of an invention, it must pass these three criteria and that must be there in your head. I'm doing this because when we do the patentability assessment, we look of it at novelty and inventor step. What is an inventor step? Because novelty, you know, whether it's new, it is not new. I'll explain to that as I go along. But what is an inventor step? It means a feature of an invention that involves a technical advancement as compared to existing knowledge. Or it should have an economic significance or both. And it should also make the invention not obvious to a person skilled in the art. So inventor step does take a long time. And even for a lot of people who have been in the patent field, we are sometimes looking at what this is the inventor step, what are the different types of inventor step. So when you're writing your patent application, many times the patent agent or the patent attorney will say, 
okay, tell me what is it that you have done, which is a technical advancement, which is an improvement. And it should not have been obvious to a person skilled in the art. Just by changing NACL to KCL will not be an invention. So small changes will not be an invention, but small changes can also be an invention if you can show the technical advancement. Finally, capable of industrial application means that the invention is capable of being made or used in an industry. These are your three criteria that you must always know and keep repeating it till you're clear that what is an innovation. When we write our papers, we write, this is experiments we did. But when we write a patent application, we should know whether it's a product, whether it is a process, whether it is a use, whether it's a method of treatment, what is my invention has to be, and this is the time we spend a lot of time as patent attorneys talking to our uh, researchers, what is your invention? What have you claimed? Can we broaden the scope? Can you do different experiments? And that is where we are doing. So how to make your ideas and innovations work for you? And so this can be an exclusive right over the creation of one's intellect. You do get a monopoly. It can be a negative right, it can be a positive right. As I told you in patents, it's a negative right. You can stop others from using it, but not necessarily that you can use it because there's something called freedom to operate. So before you use it, you need to check a freedom to operate to see whether you can use it. You can stop all others from using it, but that doesn't mean that you can use it. So that is why we call that patent as a negative right. And so also it can be bought, sold, licensed. So you've got an invention that are people who are serial entrepreneurs, serial innovators, serial inventors, but they need not come to commercialization and they will license their innovations to others. And so it can be bought, it can be sold, it can be inherited and so on. But the patent that you file, it is valid only in the jurisdiction in, in which it is granted. There's nothing like a worldwide patent. So you have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction, that is country by country, if you want to get protection for it. Uh, intellectual property rights are the first step to commercialize your innovations by inventors. I will just give some examples. Can the wheel be an innovation? Is it an invention? You'll say, no, no, it was not thousands of years before. And nobody can get a claim for a wheel as such. But an application of a wheel to something can be done. I'll just give an example. Earlier on, we had suitcases. It did not have wheels. And so we had to have coolies, we had to have people to carry the luggage, to carry the suitcases when you went by train or by other means. But then somebody got an idea. Wheels were very well known. Suitcases were very well known. And they put the wheel to the suitcase. And today, you ask anybody, they'll say, oh, did you have suitcases without wheels? But that's an invention. Suitcases were known, wheels were known, but the idea of putting a wheel to a suitcase was not known. And that is your invention. So you have to be very clear. People will say, no, both are known. What is so great about it? But nobody before me had the idea of putting a wheel on, on, a, on a suitcase so that I can just pull it along and I don't have to carry it. So there are many such applications of a wheel to an item, to an object, and it's a way you think. I'm just trying to give some very simple ideas that people should not think, oh, no, no, I can't get an invention. So when you write a wheel, you'll say a hub to receive an axle, a rim, a plurality of spokes connecting the hub with the rim. But where is it used for? It can be used, as I said, in a suitcase. It can also be used in vehicles, a road roller. So wheels have many, many uh, applications and each wheel is different the way you think of it it can be different you can also model it differently and so on so here the wheels have a purpose the wheels what is the purpose what is the wheel doing you don't claim only for the wheel you claim the wheel with the vehicle or you know that a wheel is used in pottery so how do you use it so here are the applications of wheels to real life innovations and so I just want to tell you that people always think, oh, it has to be some very, very earth shaking experiments that we have to do before we get an innovation. No, it's the way you want to put your innovations that will come to practice. I also give a simple example of chairs. 
as you see, each of these, we have eight different types of chairs, right? And people will say, so what? There are so many chairs, already a chair is, but each one is a different chair. And therefore each one is novel, each one is new, each one is different from the other. And that's how you assess novelty. And the novelty lies in a specific part of that uh, chair. Everybody knows the first one, the one, number one, is a normal chair. It has a seat, it has a backrest, and it will have four uh, legs. Every chair might have that. But let's look at the rocking chair. The rocking chair also has a seat. It also has a backrest. It also has four legs. But where is the innovation? The innovation is in the rocking part of it. That first chair, I cannot rock. So like my grandparents want to use or grandpa wants to use and they would like to have a rocking chair. And that is where the rocking chair. I'm not going to give explanation. If you look at number four, that is useful for folding. I don't have space in my house. I'd like to fold my chair and keep it. Or let's look at number seven. I gave the example of wheels in a suitcase. This is a wheels for a chair so that I can easily move it from one end to the other end and it's easy to move it. And therefore the wheel is known, the chair is known, but one great person had the idea of putting a wheel for a chair where you can then use it. So you have to remember how you're going to be your innovations, think about it, brainstorm it, and then you can come with, uh, with the ideas and innovations. It's not just research. So when you come, you have to think, what are the types of claims that I can have? Can I have a product claim? Can I have a process claim? Can I have a use or an application claim? Can it be a method of treatment claim? Can it be a composition claim or a means to function claim? So you have to think how to do and you can have multiple uh, claims, independent claims or dependent claims for covering. So if you have a product, the process to make the product can also be there. Of course, India may not allow use claims, may not allow method of treatment claims, but today we are living in a global world. Today, you don't think of innovations only for India. When you think of innovations, you think of innovations for the whole globe or for certain regions of the globe. And therefore, you need to be careful, you need to think and even if it's a known compound, but it's a new use of a known compound or a new application for that, you can get a patent in other countries. So I think always don't think of it only as a product and a process. Think of the applications of that, the method of treatments, composition, and means to function types of claims. This is very important for us. So I just want to again give a little like a summary it has to be a new idea, which nobody has done before, but it's an application. It will result in doing an invention for the first time. Like I said, wheels on a suitcase, wheels on a chair are all first innovations. It did both existed, but only somebody can go and put it. You need to also understand where your technology lies and what are you doing with that technology? Is it a touch screen to activate a GUI? Is it a chair on the wheels? So you need to understand that you may be using established technology, but you're coming up with a new product or you're coming up with a new technique to do the same product. That is, I can have different methods to make the same chemical product. So that is also an invention. And you also need to see how to achieve the goal. It's a way, it's, a, it's finding a way of doing something that others have not done. And if others did not do it and you were the first person to do it, this becomes your inventive idea, like orientation of a display or even a post-it pad. That was an adhesive which didn't work very well. And then somebody said, oh, I can do this very well and came up with these adhesives for post-it. And that bring, brought about a whole industry by itself. It's also important that the person who files first gets the innovation. So we have the first to file principle in all countries of the world. It never used to be in the US, but it is there. Again, invention is novel, inventive, and has to be useful. First to file, so go and put your application, but you need to know when to file the application. You cannot do it when it's in the idea stage, when it is nearly ready, and within a year you can get everything done. That's the time you go and file. So it's an idea, 
and also putting the idea to practice. And that is what we call reduction to practice, what we call enablement. It's just not disclosing your invention, but have I enabled it? Can I brought it to practice? Have I reduced it to practice is also important. Same again, your invention can be only in the jurisdictions that you filed. There's nothing like a worldwide pattern. And also remember, simple innovations can also be patentable. A lot of people ask, and yesterday or somebody asked again, are softwares patentable? Software per se are not patented, but software implemented innovations can be patentable subject matter. I'd now like to go, I talked about innovations. I'd like to go earlier. What do you do? How do you get innovations? by doing R&D in the lab. And therefore, you create. Now, when you create, you're doing experiments. But today's talk that I want to spend time on is how do you document all the things? It's very important. And we Indians are not very good in documentation. And therefore, I'd like all of you all to spend a few minutes to see documentation is one of the most important things you want to patent your invention, even if it's an idea, document it, date it, sign it. The most important thing for a researcher is his research books. And that is considered as non-consumed. So if you go into big labs and laboratories, and you will see they'll give you a book, notebook, but those cannot be thrown out. Each of the pages will be numbered. 1 to 100, 1 to 150. You cannot tear out any page. You cannot scribble on it. And these are called as log books. And these are non-consumables. You may leave the lab after your research, after your PhD, but the book stays on. And I tell you, as a researcher, we need to be very clear and we need to document everything that we do. I always feel that we as Indians, we have a lot of oral tradition. That is, we like to talk from generation to generation, but we are not good in documentation. For a patent, documentation is very important. I always say that the Chinese were good in documentation. Japanese are superb in documentation. The Western people are also good in documentation. So if you have to learn about the Ashoka period, you need to go and look at a Chinese writer who talked about the Ashoka period. I mean, this is to give an example. And I keep stressing because I was a researcher. I was a scientist for 25 years. And only when I went abroad, when my postdoc, I realized the value of keeping your research books. Because that's the first thing that we were taught is what is a research book? How do you write on it? How do you sign it? So every day you do your work, every experiment is documented, signed, dated and countersigned by either person in your lab or your senior person. This is necessary for all researchers. And the book is a non-consumable and it belongs to the institute. It belongs to the company. It belongs to the employer and it does not belong to the researcher. And that is something that we need to be very clear about. Every detail of the experiments performed, the materials used, what was the experimental uh, data that you have? Everything will have to be. If you come out with a HPLC or a PCR data, you take a printout, it has to be stuck. You need to date it, you need to sign it, and it has to be countersigned as well. You need to keep a record of all your working examples, your non-working examples, the best mode of working the innovation. Earlier on, I've seen that if you don't have the best mode, your patents can be revoked. In India, we still have the best mode. Many countries have taken it off. So best mode may not be known at that time. But if you know the best mode of working the invention, it is important that you also note it down. You may not know at that time, but later on it will come to help you more. And now record who did the experiments for inventorship. Many times the professors will come and give ideas. It's important that that is also written down. Because many times, even the senior professors can be asked, what is your contribution to the invention? It may be the idea, but did we write it down? Did we put it properly? And so on. So all the discussions, meetings, everything to be recorded. You need to record the drawings of your prototypes, models, CAD design, whatever else you have. Anything and everything 
your notebook is very important and it has to be you can keep and in the form of a, um, a digital way but most people prefer to have it in the form of a, a hard notebook even if you have it in the digital it can be e-signed today everything is digital so you can have digital way of recording it but put the date and keep it because the date of the invention when you brought it to practice when you enabled it is also very important uh, keep all the meeting notes and this i said is a non-consumable and it belongs to the employer all the above is confidential it cannot go out of the lab because this, if your book goes out to somebody else, your whole invention is gone. It cannot be taken out of the lab and it is the property of the lab or the employer and it has to remain confidential. There are sometimes we look at references. We don't, we write it in a, you know, blotting paper. I've seen students, where is your experiment result? They'll show me one scrap paper and say, ma'am, this is the result. Or heart may write them. Yeah, ma'am, this is the result. No. Everything has to be noted. You need to keep a log of all the important references that you use. And these are important because sometimes we need to disclose it, especially to USPTO and others. So this is a way of not only recording all your experiments, but also recording all the important publications. What did you read about it? Note it down and just write one or two lines about that publication. It will help you. At a later time, when you draft the applications, we say, what is the closest prior art? What was your references? And this will come in useful. Um, I would like to... Uh, uh, next thing that is important is agreements. Why do I say agreements is so important? Reason is there can be a non-disclosure agreement that you need because you may be disclosing your innovation to a third party. And before you disclose your innovation to others, you write a get a non-disclosure agreement. And today we have that. When you want to get funding with the Department of Biotechnology or Department of Science and Technology or MITE, there is a non-disclosure agreement because you're disclosing your innovation even before it is done. It could be an idea. And so those non-disclosure agreements are very important because if somebody says, I knew it, they are bound by the non-disclosure agreement. Those are contractual agreements. It is used when you disclose your information outside the organization. And it is also necessary to avoid loss of novelty or lack of novelty or allegations that it was already disclosed in the public. These NDAs, non-disclosure agreements with a third party, with another organization is very important. Employer employee agreements are also important. So many people think, no, 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 he's a student, he's very good, he's an employee, very good, he's a researcher, he's a student, they're all good. But they will come, work, and leave. And therefore, you need to have non disclosure agreements with the researchers, with the students, whoever is part of the lab, right from the top to the bottom, because all these belong to the company, belong to the institute, belong to the university. And so these non-disclosure agreements right from the professor to the students are required. It's also used to establish the ownership rights over IP created during the employment in general or research time that in general. Deed of assignment. So inventions generally, the applicant will generally be the company or the institute or the university, the employer. And therefore, the inventors are the ones who are inventing it and they need to assign their rights. So when they're doing the invention, it's important to get this deed of assignments, either at the time of the filing, even before filing. And it's better to have it specific for each patent application. You can have that in your employer-employee agreements. I didn't talk about it because it's more for students and researchers. But when you join a company, there's an employer employee agreement which says that all your inventions will be assigned to your employer. Uh, those I didn't talk about it because this was more for students and faculties members. But that's also some of the agreements that we do. You also need to check for contractual obligations when you you take in a material, you've taken a, a microbe from somebody, you've used something. All those agreements should also be recorded and kept because tomorrow you can run into problems. I know people 
when you sign an agreement, you'll say, I'll use this polymer or I'll use this chemical or I'll use this microbe or even a PCR, I use a TAC polymerase. You are bound by that agreement or you take a strain from somewhere. You are bound by that agreement. You may not have read the agreement, but they'll say it's good for research, but you cannot do it for commercialization. So every agreement that you sign, even when you purchase a chemical, many times you are bound by an agreement. So please look at those contractual obligations when you are getting material from outside or just a joint research or you're getting a material from a company, you have to be careful to understand what are your obligations and keep that in mind. So these are two important uh, things, points I thought which is needed for um, documentation. Next comes commercialization. And so unless you have all this, you've got your patent, you've drafted your patent, you've got it, and you do the commercializing. Commercialization is important because it will give you the maximum output or returns for the IP. And it helps in, in innovators, inventors, or the companies get the maximum value of their inventions ideas, brands, creations. So today you will see that if Elon Musk could buy Twitter for 44 billion, I'm thinking in my mind, what is this 44 billion um, that he's got? What is the value? The value is for that platform. So there can be some platform technologies. There could be improvement technologies. And therefore the value is what people feel the value will be in the market whether it is by revenue, whether it is by advertisement, whether it is by marketing. And today, Elon Musk could use his Twitter for doing all his marketing and so on. So remember, the value of the company is a notional value, is a value for the brand. It is value for the platform technology. It's a value. And why that value is there? Because I can see a use in the future. And that's what gives you the brand value. The brand value, and if it is not protected, you know, it will be very difficult because a lot of people can copy it. And so even words like Twitter can be can be um, protected by trademark. So don't think only patent, but also think of words or logos that you want to protect it because everything put together will give you a lot of value. And you need to have a license agreements. It's cross licensing agreements. How are you doing the funding of research? How do you fund institution? All these will happen when you have the um, commercialization. I've talked about it. I don't want. Uh, Ankush, how much time do I have? Or should I stop with this? Another few minutes. Can I go ahead, Ankush? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Just stop me uh, and when you want, and I will be there. Uh, next is the patentability assessment. As I told you that, what is my invention? I told you there's a three criteria, novelty, inventor step, and utility, that is capable of industrial application. And so these are important. Usually utility is taken for granted because you won't do an invention in this and until it is useful for you. And therefore, most important for the patentability is your novelty assessment. Is it novel? I showed you the chairs, right? Each chair is novel because it has a feature which is different from the others. And we also do inventive step, but basically we do novelty assessment first to see whether your subject matter is novel. If not, we can tweak it, we can change it, we can modify it, we can improve it to come with better innovations or improvement innovations. There are very few innovations which are platform technology. And if you do come up with a platform technology, you can get a large scope of your invention. But if it's a specific invention or an improvement invention, you'll get it only for that. So first is you need to understand your invention. And that is why I did talk about it in the beginning. Otherwise, you'll say, what is novelty or prior art search? We all, when we do research, we do review of literature. But how many of us do review of the patent literature? Because the review of the patent literature will tell you who are the people filing patents, who are your competitors, what applications have been filed, and so on. So let me give you this example of COVID testing. People say RT-PCR, people will say ELISA testing, people will say so many other things that you can do. 
and therefore you need to understand what is your antibody, what is your antigen, how did you do it, what chemicals did you use, what was the probe you used, was it RT-PCR, was it just PCR, what is it? Is all these are forms part of your features of your invention. Now it can be, it should be actually prior art, should be conducted before filing of the patent application and it has to be side by side as you are doing your innovations, you will see whether people have filed such patents or even published any, pat any review, any papers in that area. It is required to determine the novelty of the invention before filing. Otherwise, I file without a novelty assessment and tomorrow the controllers in the patent office like Dr. Dinesh Patel and others will come and say, no, 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 there's not, no novelty. All features are there in this one publication and your novelty is lost. So for a novelty to be lost, all features of the invention should be there in one prior art. And that is called as novelty assessment. And generally we don't allow mosaicing, but one prior art which teaches all features of your invention is considered as novelty destroying document. It can be a patent document, it can be a non-patent document, you need to search both. And when you have your novelty assessment done and your prior art search, it helps in writing a better patent application. And later on, it will avoid costs of either giving up your patent application or costs for filing a patent application for the product or the process or the use or the method. All those can be understood when we do the um, novelty assessment. There's also a little, it is novelty assessment is the day that I file the application, any publication even one day before will destroy. Sometimes publication will happen later. That will not be a destroying dog, novelty destroying document. And that as and when you do, you will understand that. So when I do the patentability assessment, I need to first make a list of all the features of the invention. You need to formulate the keywords and you formulate the search strategy. How am I going to go about it? What are the databases I'm going to do? Who are all the key uh, competitors? Who are the scientists working in this area? Who are the important innovators or researchers in this area? These are search strategies and it takes some time to go and do your search strategy. You can do a preliminary search, but you need to keep refining your search strategy. You can include synonyms for various terms, go into Wikipedia, go into other things, look for similar terms and include synonyms as well. You need to refine your search strategy as and when you get, if you get too many hits, that means you've taken a very broad scope. If you've got no hit, that means there was something really wrong in it. And therefore you need to define and refine your search strategy, your key strings that we call and get to the right number of hits. Uh, and then you record all the relevant results. You may have many, but you'll go and read each one and say, are these relevant or not? And after you've got these results, you will differentiate your invention from the relevant results and say, these are the features of my invention, which is different. For example, a wheel in a chair, on a chair, that wheel is the one which is differentiating that, correct? So you don't claim for the wheel, you claim for the chair with a wheel. And that's how we make all the differentiation. Uh, here, just to show you, each of these are novel. And for each of it, you'll say, this is the different feature that is there, a rocking chair, or a wheel on a chair, or a carved chair. So you need all a folding chair. <clears throat> these are all the different features that you will do. There are several patent databases, which are free, and you can use it for novelty assessment. You can also use Google search for the others. So first and very easy to do is Google patents. You also have WIPO patent scope. They're very good searches there. You can use the WIPO search. These are free. Spacenet by EPO is very good. It's called Worldwide Spacenet. And then you have India, which is in pass and it's improving day by day. And we use it a lot if you want to use the India work. And the other patent offices are USPTO, JPO, China, and so on. You also have something called as a global dossier in the space net, which gives you for at least five different countries. So I would use all these, like the Google patent, the WIPO patent score, 
a space debt by EPO in pass and also USP2, you need to be a little more um, good researcher, good searcher to use the other ones like USPTO, JPO, and China. So these are useful databases. You can use the keywords and you can do, if you want to go for Google pattern, you enter, you can do this. I don't have to tell here, I just put it a wheel and a chair and you'll get all the hits. You can go and hit on it. You'll get a lot of information and that's how you go and refine your search if you want. So you want a chair with an armrest with wheels and that's how you will get it. With this, uh, Ankush, I can stop. And uh, if anybody has any um, questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, but if you feel I can go on further, I'll be happy to take it on. And uh, we have now have we don't have any specific question from the audience right now. You can go ahead. Uh, oh. You can explain the common FAQ you also face among your clients uh, about patents like. Yeah. Tell me again what you want me to do. I'm continuing it. Yes, yes, you can continue, ma'am. Also, you can explain uh, common FAQs you face from your clients uh, on the patents itself. Yeah, sure. So as I'm talking, I'm I think I'm also giving you those FAQs, what the questions are, and all that. Uh, so when I said to do novelty assessment, when we do, we also do something called a patent and research landscape. Uh, why do we do this? We do this because we would like to know when you do your research, you do something called as review of literature. The first few months, you just go and look at all the literature that is there, understand what people are doing. So similarly, you can do a patent landscape and a scientific landscape as well, and you can merge it together and see what it is. So when you do a scientific landscape, you go and look at the scientific papers, conference papers, what are the unsolved problems? Because remember, a patent is a solution to a problem. So you need to understand what is the problem and what is my solution. If that is clear, it's easy to write your patent. So problem solution approach is very important for us to understand where your invention lies. And therefore, there could be unsolved problems in the field. And that we do when researchers start working with companies, with institutes, where they say, these are the issues that we are having. These are the problems that we are having. And then you go and try to identify a solution to the problem. So unsolved problems, you can go and identify cross citations. Who are your competitors um, in the research in your field? You also need to be aware what others are doing in your field of research and identify collaborations, institutions working in your area of interest and so on. So this patent landscape or scientific landscape tells you who are all the people working in this area? What is the type of research they're doing and how can we learn from them? So that first was a scientific landscape. But you know, most scientists would only do a scientific landscape but we tell people to go and do a patent landscape. What do I mean by a patent landscape? Just like we have scientific literature, we also have patent literature and you can search either used on a free uh, database as I showed you before. You can also use paid databases because they collate a lot of information. You can do a lot of things with these paid databases, which may not be possible with the free database. The free database is good for doing the searches to understand where your things are. But if you want to do a more detailed one, we go and use the paid database. Uh, the patentability analysis using previous patent and non-patent literature, you need to do that. And you need to also know what is the up-to-date information on technologies, problems left unsolved, who are your competitors, who are the licenses, who are the partners, this will help you in kids in making an informed decision on how you should go ahead with your project. And so all these large companies spend a lot of time before taking up a project to do the patent landscape, the scientific landscape. And if it's a commercial one, a lot of it is important. It will be the patent landscape that they will look at. And it also helps us in identifying potential partners, research experts, for collaboration and so on. It also identifies the licensing deals and it will identify investors, who is investing in which company and so on. Because today, 
it is a startup world. A lot of people want to have be a startup and create. The value for a startup is their innovation. It is their patents that is the value for that company. And they will get you a detailed insight into the technology. The patent landscape can help you to do that. It tells you what was the past technology, what is the current technology, how is the technology monitored, what is the future of this technology, what will be tomorrow's product. A patent landscape gives you a lot of information which may not be possible in scientific literature. It will also tell you what are the important patents, who's your competitor, who got the first fundamental or platform technology patent, who got the first few patents in your area, who is collaborating with whom, and who are the leaders in certain technologies. All these you can get from the patent landscape. And therefore, we've seen people, oh, this one, they keep a tab on what they are doing as far as the patent is concerned. Now, inventions based on, uh, based on research is not necessarily based on the requirements. Uh, now, you, what do I mean by that? It's very important for us to understand where is your innovation? Is it a platform technology, like a location-based services platform? Or is it a CRISPR gene editing tool, CRISPR-Cas genome editing tool? If it is a platform technology, like we have the siRNA, technology. There are several which are platform technologies. Once you have a platform technologies, then you can go way ahead and get many, many innovations which will all fall within the thing. So you need to understand where your inventions are. Or is it an improvement on the existing technology? Is it an application? Or is it a use of a new, new use of a known invention? Is what you should think about. Is it a method of treatment? So you need to go through and understand where your innovation is, what do I sell? If I have to license, what am I licensing? A product, a process, an application, or a use? It can be a concept, like batteries, coming up with new batteries, okay? Or patenting a receptor, or something, receptor where you can get multiple antibodies. So these are concepts as well, and you should know where your invention lies so that you can get those. You can write your in things in a broad way. Uh, how do you survive? You have to survive because you need to know how to survive in this technology. So it's very important for us to obtain funding if you want to continue your research. And therefore, you need to propagate and teach innovators on how to conceptualize, write good research projects, and also how to write good research business plans because nobody is going to invest in your company if you do not have a good business plan. You have to identify the funding sources, identify professionals um, in help to help them get you funds and commercialize your innovations, create prototypes, but be careful with disclosure, another aspect of protection. If you already disclosed your innovation, you will not get your patent for that. And so this is the gene editing thing where you can disrupt the gene, you can delete the gene, or you can add the gene. And this is the famous CRISPR-Cas technology for which Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier have got the Nobel Prize. And there was also the Broad Institute, MIT, which are also working on parallel technologies. So they were doing it for prokaryotes, microbes, they were doing for eukaryotes, which are larger uh, species like plants and animals. And you'll see, because there's a platform technology, they founded startups. They were all university people, but they started uh, startups and the startups started giving license to different, to different companies on a certain aspect of the invention. So your invention is a platform, so you can give it green, those are for agriculture or for research and tools that is given in black, or for a specific treatment, cancer, or CAR T technology, or it is a drug for often uh, drugs, or where there are very rare diseases. So all these, depending on the in interest of the people, they have gone and licensed those technologies. And this is what we call as the landscape 
where you can see people collaborating with one another. This is just to give you that this one technology CRISPR-Cas has led to so many licenses and there are many more. This is a 2018 paper, but just to tell you the wealth of this technology and how you can get licenses and you don't have to commercialize everything, but you can do this. With this, I will stop. And uh, this is about our firm. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Ankur. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for the wonderful and insightful session. So we don't have any question in our, our YouTube comment section. I think you explained very uh, things in the detailed manner. So they don't have any doubt in this regard. Uh -oh. so, yes. Yes. Madam has rightly said without IP protection and values of like our ideas will be lost and explained very well how to make uh, the ideas innovations work for us. And she explained very well the importance of documentation and NDA for the like employers and employees and like that. And she also breaks some common myth about the patent event. And with these take home points, uh, I am concluding this session. I hope you all enjoyed this uh, knowledgeable session. And we will meet again tomorrow for our third and fourth session, which will the like continuity of this lecture series. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.